You better get off that truck or you're going to wake up and find yourself dead, was the warning 16-year-old Roderick Royster got from his father in New Jersey during the summer of 1978. The warning probably had more to do with a teenage boy about to go against his father's wishes more than anything else, but it would turn out to be a close brush with a chilling fate and one that spared the young boy from sharing a cruel end with some of his friends. The truck that Roderick and his friends were sitting in was in Newark, New Jersey, a city that was in the middle of a cataclysmic downfall. What had once been a bustling and thriving city was now drowning as violent crime rates rose over 91% from the previous year. With it now being dangerous to even cross the street, over 125,000 people, a third of Newark's population, had left the city by the 1990s. But what happened to Roderick and his friends took place in the 1970s, only a decade into what would turn out to be Newark's most dangerous years. Already by then, abandoned buildings littered the city streets as local businesses closed down and families were forced out of their homes. With the city services and law enforcement already struggling to keep up with the sudden surge in crime rates, firemen and women would often show up to the scene of burning buildings and watch as they burned to the ground. One less abandoned building to look after was one less thing for them to keep an eye on, so most of the time, authorities were only on the scene to make sure that the fire didn't spread to a building that was still in use. In 1978 alone, the same year that Roderick and his friends found themselves at a crossroads, there were over 2,600 fires in abandoned buildings across the city. But to get back to the truck where Roderick's father came out of his house to see his two sons sitting in it, they were actually sitting there with Melvin Pittman, Ernest Taylor, Alvin Turner, Randy Johnson and Michael McDowell. The boys were all African American and were between the ages of 16 and 17 years old and they were all from Newark. They were also at the end of what had been a long summer's day, but they still had plans that they wanted to see through that night. That afternoon, they'd been playing basketball together in Westside Park. Then they split up for a few hours to head home and eat dinner, and now they were looking to make some extra money. The owner of the truck they were all sitting in was a man in his mid-twenties named Lee Evans. Tall, bald, and someone who was known locally as Big Man, Lee was a carpenter who often employed teenagers to help him out when he had extra work, or even just some chores that needed doing. That night, Lee Evans was moving house, and the seven teenagers in the back of his truck were there to earn a few extra bucks and help him out. For whatever reason, when Roderick's father saw his two sons sitting there, he told them to get out of the truck, and that was where the fates of all the young boys split. Roderick and his brother went one way, and what would be later known as the Clinton Avenue Five went the other. Lee Evans took the rest of the boys to his house, where they helped him pack up and move what was left of his boxes, but they were done well before any of them had thought they would be. Not wanting to end the night prematurely, the boys caught a lift with Lee, who according to his own statement, dropped the boys off near a local ice cream parlour. Witnesses later saw some of the boys there. They also saw at least three of the boys in Lee's truck going down Clinton Avenue at around 2300 hours, but after that, all traces of the boys seemed to vanish into thin air. They never came home. They never made any contact with their families, and they were never seen again. Knowing that none of the boys had shown any signs of wanting to run away, all five of their families reached out to the police, who searched the area and even dredged the local waters but it was like the boys had simply walked off the face of the earth. Media coverage about the five missing teenagers was minimal at best. So few people outside of Newark even knew what was happening and there were very few leads to go off of too. Lee Evans was a huge part of the initial investigation. In fact, he was named the prime suspect. He was the last one to have seen all five boys alive, and witnesses could place at least three of them in the back of his truck driving down Clinton Avenue that night. But why would Lee Evans have wanted to do anything to them? They had just helped him move, and Lee was known in the community, especially for trying to help the local youth make legitimate money instead of having to turn to crime. Roderick believed he had the answer. 
He told the police that Michael McDowell had given him two ounces of cannabis right before he disappeared. Roderick said, he told me he had seven pounds of weed. Michael said he stole it, but didn't say who from. Could it have been Lee Evans that Michael had stolen from? And would Lee have gone so far as to enact his revenge on all five of the boys who'd helped him move? The police definitely thought this was a possibility. They brought Lee in for questioning several times, but officially dismissed him as a suspect after he passed a polygraph test. Whether the result of the polygraph test would stand up in court today or not, there was no physical or forensic evidence to tie Lee to the disappearances of the boys. Witnesses had seen them together on the night the boys had gone missing, but aside from that, the police had nothing. They couldn't even definitively say what had happened to them. Days after they disappeared, one of their families received a call from an unnamed person who claimed that he knew where the boys had gone and would tell their families where if they paid him $750. The police had known that it was a possibility that someone would call and ask for ransom money, so the home phones had all been tapped and the police were able to trace the call back to the caller. They got a hit on a payphone out in Washington, D.C., but by the time their fellow officers had reached the scene, there was no one in sight. This was quickly followed a few days later by someone who claimed that the boys were in a prison in Washington. The caller offered to pay the $150 needed for the boys to post bail, but then hung up before any arrangements could be made. Law enforcement had no records of any of the boys being in prison and quickly decided that both calls had been pranks. But if that were true, that also meant that they had no legitimate leads outside of Lee Evans and that path of the investigation had already come to a dead end. With no new evidence in the case, the Clinton Avenue Five's trails went cold and five families were left without answers. That was until 2008, almost 30 years to the day that the boys had gone missing without a trace, when someone came forward with news that blew the case wide open. His name was Philander Hampton, a man who was in prison for an unrelated crime, but more importantly for the prosecution, he was Lee Evans's cousin. Philander approached law enforcement, claiming that he knew what had happened to the Clinton Avenue Five and that he had even played a part in the alleged events of that night. According to him, after they'd helped him move, Lee had asked Philander to lure the boys into an abandoned house in Camden Street, where Lee had a terrible surprise waiting for all of them. When Philander brought the boys in, Lee allegedly pointed a gun at all five teenagers and forced them into a wooden closet. He then reportedly nailed the closet shut and began pouring gasoline around it and throughout the abandoned property. Lee then asked Philander for a match and believing that all of this was some sort of prank, Philander gave him one. According to Philander, he never saw Lee light the match but he did see the house go up in flames and he never saw the boys come out of it. To corroborate his story, there were records of a fire in the area that night that even spread to some of the neighbouring houses, but what the police were still lacking was motive. Philander had an explanation for that too, and quickly told them that all of this had been because the boys had stolen weed from Lee and he had wanted to get his revenge on them. Investigators took this claim seriously and went out to the wreckage at Camden Street, but it had been over 30 years since it had burned down and there was nothing left. They even used ground-penetrating technology to search for human remains, but again, they found nothing. Despite this, and a lack of any other corroborating evidence, the prosecution believed that they had enough to go on trial. They arrested Lee Evans and charged both him and Philander with arson and murder. Philander almost immediately pleaded guilty and accepted a reduced plea deal of 10 years on the condition that he testified against his cousin, the man he'd accused of being the mastermind behind the kidnap and murder of the five teenage boys. But even before the case went to trial, there was trouble on the horizon for the prosecution. Both Lee and Philander's bail had originally been set at $5 million, but a judge later took a look at the case and reduced Lee's to $950,000, citing Lee's clean criminal record and his long-standing involvement in his local community as reasons why he didn't believe that Lee was a flight risk or a threat. The judge also admitted that the prosecution had an uphill battle ahead of them to prove that without a shadow of a doubt that Lee had actually killed the boys, and perhaps he had a point. 
When the case went to court, the prosecution still had no physical or forensic evidence, and they didn't even have the bodies to prove that the boys were even deceased. Everything they had hinged on Philander's testimony, and he'd already received a lesser sentence, on the condition that he testified anyway. It didn't look good for the prosecution, even when Lee Evans made the controversial decision to defend himself. After a month of testimony from around 20 witnesses, Lee Evans faced two counts of murder for each missing boy, and he was acquitted of all 10 charges. Two years later, in 2013, Lee Evans filed a civil lawsuit against the city of Newark for falsely accusing him and misrepresenting evidence against him to the grand jurors to get his case in court in the first place. Since then, Lee Evans has made a number of claims, including that his entire case had been part of a scheme to help the mayor at the time to be re-elected, but as of right now, his lawsuit has yet to reach a conclusion. Philander Hampton was released in 2017, but with all of the evidence surrounding the missing boys being as flaky as it is, it's difficult to say whether or not justice has been served when he avoided trial by pleading guilty. It's entirely possible that if Philander had gone to court, he would also have been acquitted, but the entire court case could have been the result of Philander trying to avoid a different charge in the first place. It's not uncommon for inmates to collect information on cold cases, like Roderick's testimony about stolen weed potentially being a motive in this case. They then use this information to con the legal system. All the inmates have to do then is claim that their cellmates or another inmate confessed to being the killers or involved in cold cases to them in private. Then they can get their own sentences reduced by acting as informants and witnesses. This could have been the case here. It is possible that Philander hung his own cousin out to dry to make things easier for himself, and many people believe that's what happened. Even when the case went to trial, many people expressed doubt in Philander and his version of events. But whether they were true or not, it doesn't change the fact that five teenage boys went missing in the summer of 1978, and they have not been seen since. That's five lives potentially cut short, and five families still left reeling and without answers to this day.